I've uh, been asked uh, to read some of my own stuff. I know, forgive them, Lord. I mean, they don't. Um, yeah, we've got time to do this. So I'm going to uh, beg your indulgence uh, while I give a little background of myself, at least kind of as it pertains to poetry. I started 52 years ago this fall as a philosophy major here at UMD. Six years later and six credits shy of graduation, I decided that modern culture was not for me and I was going to dial out. And I did. And I went to the mountains of Colorado. Uh, but after a while, I got restless, so I went back to college up in Colorado, got a, got a degree, and then started a master's program in uh, intellectual history. And I completed all that course work in the comprehensive exam, and then I went to the State University of New York at Stony Brook Island to do some more graduate work. Anyway, um, walking through the COVID silenced hallways of, of, of UMD earlier while we were here, I came across these crates of recyclable books. Well, that's, I just have to see what, what textbooks are being used. So I pick up the intellectual history of the idea of progress. So this is right to, to my liking here. And the book chronicles 3,000 years of the notion of progress in the West and how it became a fervid belief in the 19th century. Um, but then recalling the carnage of World War I, the author notes a change in perspective. Um, and the, the, this author, Robert Nisbet, professor at Columbia in 1980, noted, quote, rising disillusionment with faith in Western progress is to be seen in the works of T.S. Eliot, James Joyce, Ezra Pound, and William Butler Yeats, and others who began to flourish in the 1920s. And that struck me because I thought, well, they're all poets. And, uh, and then the author adds, uh, they are without exception poets of decay and death. So this is 1980. So I started to thinking, well, that's 40 years ago. I'm thinking, I need to find somebody of consequence nowadays, because those were all big names, uh, who would have a modern take on, on uh, poetry. And son of a gun, I just happened to have the uh, an edition of the, the uh, New York Review of Books. I have all these back issues that I lug around from state to state, place to place, hoping someday to read these. And uh, sure enough, here was uh, an author, uh, Louise Gluck, G-L-U-C-K, but it has the zack zack umlaut. So you have to make it kind of a, an ui, almost. U, u. So it's Gluck, I would say. Having studied three quarters of German here. Um, anyway, she's got formidable credentials, awarded the Pulitzer Prize in Literature. She was Poet Laureate from 2003 to 2004, right after Billy Collins, who had two years, incidentally. I don't know how he managed that. And in 2020, she resides and receives a Nobel Prize for Literature. So I want to read this short poem to you to see how we are in 2022. It's entitled The Children's Story. Tired of rural life, the king and queen returned to the city, all the little princesses rattling in the back of the car, singing the song of being, I am, you are, he, she, it is. But there will be no conjugation in the car, oh no. Who can speak of the future? Nobody knows anything about the future. Even the planets do not know, but the princesses will have to live in it. What a sad day the day has become. Outside the car, the cows and pastures are drifting away. They look calm, but calm is not the truth. Despair is the truth. This is what mother and father know. All hope is lost. We must return to where it was lost if we ever want to find it again. A, ch a children's story. Now, having read this woman's Nobel lecture, I suspect that the professor and I uh, may not have much in common with our orientation to the poet's craft. So I'm gonna do one of, a short one, relatively short, one page 
of my own. And the title is, this is gonna be in my next work of stuff, which should have been ready, I thought, before this trip, but I didn't make it, anyway. Um, this is entitled Epitasis. Now, Peter Thomas, that's I, uh, does like to use vocabulary not to show that he's been to college, but to, to be precise. Epitasis in ancient Greek theater performances uh, uh, were the pivotal point, pivotal point in the play where the key events occurred that foreshadowed the eventual catastrophe in drama. Epitasis. Waiting, a vexing burden defining our fractious age, each of us sullen, irascible, like an insect sealed in a jar, constricted by the sheer mass of our own kind, we find each of our lives thwarted by stoplights and in checkout lines. Of course, animals don't wait, except maybe cats. Difficult to imagine a convocation of politic seagulls calmly queued on a beach, politely waiting their turn to dine on a fish carcass that had washed up on shore. And children of homo, homo sapiens don't wait. Consumed with themselves, the little darlings are forever clawing at the limits of restraint, thoughtlessly darting out into busy streets one minute, methodically plotting perverse mischief the next. Waiting, a once noble override of bestial cravings. Yet see how we rebel against this beneficent alienation. Now with our hairy knuckles dragging on the ground, we blithely swagger down the path that inexorably leads us back to that anarchical state of nature. Only two generations ago, when I was a kid, Humans would pause, then proudly, in chivalrous abnegation, exclaimed, you first, as they opened a door for a stranger. They embraced the paradox of individual freedom versus societal cohesion. They called it civilization. Epitasis, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.